And if you have your Bibles, you can open them to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. If you remember last week, if you were here, Paul addressed a question to the Corinthian church that they had asked him, and it concerned uh, meat sacrifice to idols. And uh, who was right? Those who felt the freedom to eat meat sacrificed to idols or those who believed a Christian should not do that? That was idolatry. And evidently it was happening in Corinth. And those who felt they had the freedom felt they had the freedom to even go into the idols' temples and eat them. And so they asked Paul. And what Paul said was kind of interesting, if you remember last week. He, first of all, started out by saying, I want to remind you that love trumps being right. It's more important to be loving one another than to be uh, flaunting your correctness when it comes to theology. And then he gave him the answer. He said, the eaters are correct. That is correct knowledge. You can eat anything. For the Christian, we no longer need to obey any food laws. Food, we know, is just organic material that goes into the body to fuel this organic body, and it's used to fuel it. The rest goes out in waste, and that's what food is for. So those were correct, who said they could eat meat sacrificed to idols. But he didn't leave it at that, did he? He said, however, for those that don't believe you can, to sin against their own conscience would be to sin against God, in a sense, and therefore you could cause them to stumble. Therefore, if it's causing someone else to stumble, you should not eat. In fact, he went so far as to say, if this is a big issue, I wouldn't eat any meat. If this was a big issue, he says, I'd go vegan. That's a jaw dropper. Because it's better to love another person and do what's best for them than to be right and exercise your rights and freedoms. Now, that's by way of review from last week in chapter 8. But it introduces a subject of how we are to handle our rights as Christians. Because we have tremendous rights and freedoms as Christians. In Christ Jesus... The beauty of the new covenant is all that law stuff where he had to do the right things to be right with God is gone. He nailed it to the cross. There is no requirements hanging over us for salvation other than to believe faith in Jesus Christ. We're set free. We are absolutely set free in that. However, we know with freedom comes responsibility. By the way, that's something our nation seems to be forgetting today, but I won't go into that sidetrack. But basically what he wants to talk about is how do we handle these rights then, since we are free in Christ, by faith alone. Now, chapter 9, like chapter 8, is not the easiest passage to go through. You know, Paul, Paul's teaching is, is kind of difficult sometimes. And what I love about uh, 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16, <laughs> where Peter talks about Paul. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. If not, you can just listen. I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but I think this is really interesting. When we go to 1 Peter, and I've got all these bookmarks that are not the ones I want. There's the one I want. Chapter 3, verse 15, he said, And regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you, as also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort, as they do, as do, as they do the rest of scriptures, to their own destruction. You know what I love about that? First of all, he says, Paul's writings, his letters, were considered as scripture contemporarily. In the day and age they were written, these churches were already recognizing, wow, this is more than just a letter. We need to copy this and pass it on to other churches. And they were getting them and going, wow, this is more than just a letter. We need to copy this and pass it on to other churches. Peter tells us that was happening presently, contemporarily. It wasn't hundreds of years later that the church got together and said, you know what, some of those Paul's letters, you know, they probably should be in the Bible. It was contemporary. They were recognizing those right away. By the way, when the church finally figured out 300 or so years later what should be in the Bible and should wouldn't, they weren't deciding what should be in the Bible. They were recognizing what the church had all, all recognized down through the ages. That's really what they were doing there. But the other thing I like is that even Peter found some of Paul's writings difficult. Like, even Peter, reading some of Paul's letters, goes, what's he talking about in this chapter? Although they didn't have chapters in those days. But anyway, you get the idea. So at any rate, this is not an easy chapter. If you just read chapter 9 without the context, you would think Paul is really arrogant. He's doing some bragging here. But in fact, that's not at all what he's doing. 
He is actually defending his apostleship, which is something that uh, we see him doing a few times in his writings, and also presenting a case study from his life on how we should handle the rights that we have as free believers in Jesus Christ. So we start out in verse 9 where he says, Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? If, uh, if to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. Now, Paul had his critics. In fact, anybody who's ever been in a leadership position knows that if you're in a leadership position, you will have your critics. But Paul certainly had his, and evidently one of the criticisms of him was he was not an apostle. He was claiming to be an apostle, and he was not one of the twelve. And so this is something he had to defend a few times in his life. And this is one place where he takes just a few minutes. And I'm going to take a few minutes just to talk about that because I think it's, it's very interesting. He defends his apostleship. He was not one of the twelve. And so I'm sure that's what they were, those people were saying. Uh, what I believe is true, now some of you will disagree with this, that there are some of you who believe that the church made a mistake when they jumped the gun and appointed Matthias to be number 12 after Judah left. Ju Judas left, uh, and later saying, no, Paul was really the one, and God made sure that that became evident to everyone. Well, that may be true, by the way. My problem with that is you don't find it anywhere in Scripture. Still, it may be true, but you don't, you don't see it. I'm not ready to pound the pulpit on that. Here's what I think, and I say I think this because you can disagree with me on this. It's okay. We'll still be brothers and sisters. But I think there is an office of apostle of which there had to be 12. Now, why there had to be 12? That's a mystery, Someday in glory, maybe we'll, it'll all be revealed and we'll know exactly why there had to be 12. But it has to do with why there had to be 12 tribes in Israel as well. You know, there were 12 tribes and there had to be 12. In the Old Testament, when God said, I, your firstborn is mine, I take your firstborn. Your firstborn son belongs to me. But instead of actually taking your firstborn, I'm taking one of the tribes. And he took the tribe of Levi which became the Levites, and they as a tribe had no land. There's not a tribe of Levi land-wise in that old that, uh, block of what is Israel because the Levites had no land. They were part of every tribe. They were everywhere to be the priests, the Levites. But there still had to be 12. So we also don't have a tribe of Joseph, who was one of the 12 there. We don't have a tribe of Joseph because they needed to have 12, so his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, each became tribes. So there had to be 12. Again, I don't understand that. I've read some people that have this all figured out. Uh, and, you know, it's interesting. My response is, that's really fascinating. I'm not ready to jump on the bandwagon, but it's interesting stuff. I know it has something to do with all the people of God. We see in Revelation around that throne, 24 elders surrounding that throne. And that represents Old and New Testament, 12 and 12. But that's all mysterious stuff. But there had to be 12 apostles. The office of apostle. I also believe there's a gift of apostle that is separate from the office of apostle, of which there are only 12. And I'll tell you why I think this. Uh, I think as he defends himself here, he says, am I not apostle? Have I not seen the Lord Jesus? Evidently, that was one of the things people said, you have to have been with Jesus. The 12, by the way, had to have been with Jesus from the very beginning. That was the rule they had in Acts when they appointed that, that uh, one who took the place of Judas. But he says, I've seen the Lord. And he did on Damascus Road. He saw the Lord. He had a personal encounter with Jesus. He says, see, that's, I have that. In another place, evidently he said, apostles have to perform miracles. In another place in Scripture, he defends that saying, I, I've had miracles happen through me. So that works for that. But then he says, are you not my work in the Lord? To others, if I'm not an apostle, I am at least to you. For you are my seal of the apostleship. He says, here's my proof that I'm an apostle. This church exists. When I came through, there was no church in Corinth. I presented the gospel in the temple, in the marketplace. A few believed. Those, I stayed, he stayed there about a year and a half, I believe, in Corinth. When he left, there was a church. He encouraged it by writing letters, by sending others. This is one of those letters of encouragement. He says, the proof there is a legitimate, born-again, true church existing in Corinth is the proof that I am an apostle. Well, what do we say about that then? I say, evidently, when you look at the gifts of the Spirit, of which apostle is listed, by the way, we will get there in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We'll talk about the gifts of the Spirit. One of those gifts is a gift of apostle. 
Now, when you look at the gifts of the Spirit, it's for the building up of the church. We know from Ephesians, the gifts are there to build up the church in love. We know that from Paul's writings. Okay, there's a gift of teaching. We need teachers to build up the church. There's a gift of shepherding. We need shepherds to build up the church. There's a gift of evangelist. We need evangelists to build up the church. You know what there's not listed there? Is a gift of missionary. A gift of those who go where no man has gone before with the gospel and plant churches. It's not found there. But there is the gift of apostle. And oh, by the way, do you know that apostle is a Greek word that does not refer to a title or an office? It's a literal Greek word. Apostello is the verb. Do you know what apostello means? Somebody tell me, Bible scholars? Sent ones. You guys are Bible scholars. It's awesome. Sent ones. The word apostle is a Greek word that literally means one who is sent. Apostello is to send. That's the verb. Apostle is the noun. Sent one. He says, I'm a sent one. You want to know what my proof is? You. I was sent here, and now there's a church. So Bob Satterley believes, and you can disagree with Bob Satterley. It's okay. Uh, I believe that the church didn't make a mistake by appointing Matthias as the 12th apostle. I believe Paul is an example of the gift of apostle, which is the gift of missionary going to where the gospel has not been, especially pioneer missionary, going where the gospel is. That's what I think. But at any rate, he defends his apostle, and he's quite clear he is one. And by the way, for, for those that believe, no, they made a mistake, and Paul was really the 12th apostle. The apostle's job was to do the teaching, and it's their ministry that produced the Bible, their teaching. That's one of the, when they finally did come around to deciding what book should be in the Bible and what wasn't. The main criteria was, does it come from the apostolic circle? So, at any rate, Paul certainly did a majority of the writing of the New Testament, so we have to go with that. But at any rate, he defends his apostleship. Okay, I'm done with that sidetrack now. We'll get back on to it. But he takes a sidetrack, so I thought I'd take one there also. Uh, now he defends himself. Here's his defense. Verse 3, my defense to those who examine me is this. Do we not have a right to eat and drink? Do we not have a right to take along a believing wife, as do the rest of the apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or do only Barnabas and I not have the right to refrain from working? So now he's, he's not just depending his apostleship, he's presenting really some of his apostolic rights as an apostle. He says, you're my proof. Now, if I'm an apostle, don't I have the right to food and drink? What that really means is don't I have the right to be fed? When the apostle came into town, they didn't have to bring their own food money or bring their own bag of goodies. They expected the people there to take care of them. So do I not have a right to take along a believing wife, as do most of the apostles? Do I not have the right to be supported by the church, as do the other apostles? If you remember back in the book of Acts, this early church, those elders who were the apostles of that initial church, the, the apostles, I say, were the elders, when there arose a need for some more people to help out, there was a problem in the church. There was a controversy over the serving of widows. They said, we can't get bogged down with that. We need to appoint some other people to handle that so we can focus on what? The Word of God and prayer. That was their ministry. The Word of God was studying it, teaching it, preaching it, and praying. That's what they were to do. So that was the focus of really what they did. They weren't to get bogged down in other things. That was a principle that Paul refers to here. He says, don't you have a right to be supported by the church? The church took care of the apostles. Paul says, I'm an apostle. Don't I have that right? And he goes on to use some examples of what he's talking about beyond just the apostles. Verse 7, who at any time serves as a soldier at his own expense? You want somebody to be a soldier? You want them to work on the side so they can support themselves in being a No, you take care of your soldiers. That's just a, a human principle. Or how about he who plants a vineyard? Does he not eat the fruit of it? You mean farmers are supposed to work this ground and not get any of the produce? Dairy farmers not drink their own milk? Those kind of things. Uh, he who tends a flock, does he not use the milk from the flock? He says, I'm not just speaking according to human judgment, am I? Or does the law not also say this? Verse 9, for it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing. God is not concerned about oxen, is he? Or is he speaking altogether for our sake? Yea, for our sake it is written, because the plowman ought to plow in hope, and the thresher to thresh in the hope of sharing his crops. He's making a point here. And what he's saying is, basically, those church leaders, those apostles, those ones doing the preaching and teaching, 
should be supported. And he says, even scripture says that. Deuteronomy 25, 4, by the way, is where that came from. Don't muzzle the ox. And then he goes on to talk about temple service. We go on to verse 11. If we sowed spiritual things in you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? If others share the right over you, do not we more? Nevertheless, we did not use this right, but we endure all things so that we will cause no hindrance to the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who perform sacred services of food in the temple and those who attend regularly to the altar have their share from the altar? This is from the priesthood. Those priests who served at the altar did not have to go find a job. When people brought sacrifices, it was in the law. A portion went to the priests. They were supported by the people. And by the way, the same was true in the pagan temples of that day and age. So his conclusion is, verse 14, in this point he's making here, so also the Lord directed those who proclaim the gospel to get their living from the gospel. That's the point he is making here. By the way, those in, in church groups that say you should not have a paid, uh, paid person doing the preaching, things like that, you know, it's not the only way to go. Certainly Paul didn't, didn't do it that way, but it is scriptural. It was scriptural from the very beginning to support those, especially that work hard at preaching and teaching. So that's, that's laid out there. However, he's just building up the point he's making. This is really not his point. This is the buildup for it. Because what he's really talking about is, what do we do with our right? He says, I have the right for you guys to feed me. I have the right to have a wife with me if I want. I have the right for you to support me as an apostle. That's how it's done in the church. But... What he's talking about here is how we handle our rights, especially the way we lay them down for something that's more important. Verse 15, but I have used none of these things. I am not writing these things so that it will be done so in my case, for it would be better for me to die than to have any man make my boast an empty one. For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for I am under compulsion. For woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. And if I do this voluntarily, I have a reward. But if against my will, I have a stewardship entrusted to me. What then is my reward? That when I preach the gospel, I may offer the gospel without charge, so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. What he's saying is, my rights do not need to be held on to, to grasp and held tightly. For the sake of the gospel, I lay those down. I lay down the right to be fed. I lay down the right to have a wife with me. I lay down the right to be supported by you. Paul, whenever he went, he always worked and paid his own way. That was his thing. Now, that's not the way it was done by everybody, but Paul was explaining, this is why I'm doing this, so that the gospel will be given freely, so that no one can ever make the claim that I'm doing this for money or doing this for prestige or doing this for any material benefit. I don't want that to get in the way of any gospel that goes out from me. Because of the gospel, I lay down my right to these things, which I fully have a right to. And he's not saying that's wrong. And he's not saying those others are less in the, in the kingdom of God because they are supported by the church. He's saying, this is why I've done this. This is the point I'm making. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a backup to what he said about meat sacrificed idols. For the sake of loving others, Lay down your rights. Yes, you can eat this meat, but if it's bothering somebody, lay it down. That's love. Now he's saying for the gospel, lay down your rights for the sake of the gospel. And he's not done there. He goes on <clears throat> to get a little more specific for exactly what this means. Verse 19. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all so that I may win more. He said, although I'm free, what's the kingdom of God about? It's about winning people to Jesus Christ. It's about proclaiming the gospel so that people may believe. He said, my freedoms are laid down for that. If my being a slave will make the gospel prosper, that's what I willingly and freely do. You know what the greatest freedom is for a Christian? The freedom to lay down what what's, we have a right to. How does the world do that? No, it's my right. I'm not letting anybody stomp on my rights, right? We're good Americans. We fight for our rights. People have died for our rights. We don't like to lay down, lay down any of our rights. Somebody tells us we should not be eating meat when we like a good steak. No one's going to tell us that. He says, you know, in the gospel, that's not what's important. Our freedoms are not to serve ourselves. Our freedoms are to serve 
the one who saved us. And if laying down our freedoms and our rights helps that, that's what we should do. He says, that's what I do. Verse 20, to the Jews I became a Jew so that I might win the Jews. To those under the law, as under the law, though not being under the law, so that I might win those who are under the law. He says, you know what, when I'm talking to Jews, when I'm hanging out with Jews, I don't have to do any of that stuff anymore. I don't have to obey the food laws. I don't have to obey all, the, all those Jewish things. But when I'm hanging out with Jews, I'm not going to let my freedom get in the way of my gospel. I don't want them to have something against me so that they won't hear what I'm going to say. I lay aside those rights and I live just like a Jew. I follow those laws to a T. And Paul lived this out, by the way. Does it mean that I have to? No, I'm free. But you know what? I lay down those freedoms for the sake of the gospel. He says, verse 21, to those without law, as without law, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those who are without the law. Without the law, he's not talking about outlaws here. Okay, he's not talking about going to you know, outlaws and living like an outlaw. Because there is a thing, the law of Christ he mentioned, which is not a law like you obey this and you're not a Christian, but there's some principles for living guided by our faith in Jesus Christ. Spirit-inspired and spirit-drawn uh, abilities to do what's pleasing to the Lord and know what's pleasing to God. So we're not called to do anything that is ungodly. But outside of that context, going to Gentiles with no law, he lived like a Gentile. When Paul went into a Gentile house, he had a BLT. Bacon, lettuce, and tomato. Well, I don't know if he had that, but he would eat pork. No Jew would ever do that for the sake of the gospel. Do you get what he's saying here? To the weak, verse 22, I became weak. You know who the weak is? He referred to those in the last chapter. Those ones who believed you couldn't eat meat sacrificed to idols were considered the weaker brothers. He said to those who didn't think you could eat meat sacrificed to idols, or didn't think you could uh, drink, smoke, play cards, or dance. He says, I didn't drink, smoke, play cards, or dance. Or eat meat sacrificed to idols. For those who didn't think you could mow your lawn on Sunday, I didn't mow my lawn on Sunday. Why? For the sake of the gospel. So that nothing would interfere with the truth of the gospel being delivered. This is ultimate love, by the way. Laying down your rights. When he's with those people, even though he could do those things, he had every right. He said, no, it's laid down for that sake. Verse 23, he sums it up. I do all things for the sake of the gospel so that I may become a fellow partaker in it. That's what's important. You see, when you become a Christian, when you exit the world of death into the realm of life, when you get a new spiritual DNA from the Holy Spirit of God, which is called being born again, which changes everything, die to the old self, raised up new in Jesus Christ, you get a different worldview. What is important in the old worldview? Me, my rights, my privileges, me getting all that I can get, me being king of my realm. We're transferred from death to life. What's important in the new kingdom? The gospel of Jesus Christ and loving God and loving others. Those become priorities. It changes a worldview. All of a sudden, that takes precedent over me. Look at Jesus, Philippians chapter 2. Although he was God, didn't consider that anything to be held on to, but emptied himself of all that glory. Came down to us and didn't just come down to us. He came down to, to an us that we would never want to be. Arrested, although innocent. Tortured. Crucified. He did that out of love for us. Not only did he lay aside his glory, he became something we would never, ever, a thousand years want to be. A crucified, yet innocent criminal for our sakes. By the way, we were called to have the mind of Christ. Let that set as our example. So he says, I do all things for the sake of the gospel. And now he gives a, a wonderful illustration for us since the Olympics are going on right now. Those athletes, one, you know, I really feel bad about, one, one thing that bothers me about the Olympics, that when I watch it, it kind of makes me nervous. 
because these people have dedicated their lives for four years, just dedicated their lives, and then they go to this place where one bad performance and you get nothing. And you see it happening all the time. The thrill of victory, the agony of defeat. Human drama of athletic competition. Uh, at any rate, those people do dedicate their lives to that. Here's what Paul says next. He's using, by the way, they had games in Corinth. They had every, every two years, they, they, didn't, they weren't the Olympics, but they had a, a very special type of games where every two years people come together and, and would have this kind of competition. We know that historically. He says in verse 24, Do you not know that those who run in a race, all only, only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air, but I discipline my body and make it my slave so that I have, after I have preached to others, I myself might not be disqualified. He's talking about being disqualified from the games for not following the rules. He says, okay, when these people come for these games, they dedicate their lives to that. They train, which means they abstain from certain things. They eat a certain way. They have regiments getting up and running when they'd love to sleep in. All those things is geared toward doing their best and playing by the rules. He said, they're, they're looking for a laurel wreath. That's all they get. And the human glory. He said, we have an imperishable crown. Therefore, like those athletes, I live my life in such a way as not without aim, but I discipline my body. I make it my slave so that after I preach to others, I myself might not be disqualified. Wait a minute. Aren't we free in Christ? Paul really bugs me with this stuff. Back with those meat sacrificed to idols, they were wrong. But he says, okay, but don't eat meat. Now he says, we're free. We are free. We have right to do anything. But what are we here for? Are we here for us? Are these freedoms ours to be held on to and our entertainment and our fun and our good, wonderful life? Or were we bought with a price of the precious blood of Jesus Christ so that we too would be willing to give our lives for others? And what is this love that he preaches throughout this book? Giving of yourself for others, considering the needs and interests of others more important than your own, the mind of Christ. It's laying down your rights for the sake of others, and especially for the sake of the gospel. We Americans have to do a little adjustment on this, because we're really into rights. We're, we're the most free country on the face of the earth, and we love that. And I'm not saying it's bad to be an American. <laughs> Please don't get me wrong there. But spiritually, sometimes we have to make an adjustment. Sometimes we have to repent, reorder our lives around the kingdom of God. Because these rights and these privileges that we have in Christ are very real. But what is love? Laying down your rights. Paul says, this is my life. Let my life be an example. I am an apostle. Because I'm an apostle, I have the right to all these things. I lay that down because I want to magnify the gospel. He says, well, I'm with certain people. I don't do things I could do because I want them to hear the gospel. I don't want them to be distracted by little disagreements we might have over things. Even if they're wrong and I'm right, that's not what's important. What's important is the good news of Jesus Christ, that they might be saved. Then we'll let the Holy Spirit work on them. Freedom, true freedom in Christ, is a freedom to lay down your rights for the sake of others. And that, my friends, is love. Redefined by God. You know, we had Valentine's Day the other day. Isn't that that day of love? Where, you know, someone who you love, you give something to. How about the love of Christ? While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's real love. None of this phony Valentine's Day stuff. I'm sorry, but, you know, we need to go a little deeper than that. It's not just loving the lovely. It's not just loving the most loved one in your life. Jesus Christ loved those who were spitting on him. We're called to love like that. Lay down our right to be right 
for the sake of others. Let's pray.